God is good and with each day that passes brings us a day closer to the launch of Pantheon Rise of the Fallen. This is the Nathan Napalm channel and if you are new here, please consider subscribing, especially if you're interested in Pantheon related content on our March to launch. Today guys, we're going to talk about something very exciting. I'm going to break down some of these questions from the September newsletter 2019 that basically breaks down one question, the one that, that BR gets asked the most about each class in the game. One question per class. So let's get going. First up, we have the Cleric. And the question is, how will Celestial Aegis actually work? Will we see massive trains from NPCs not being able to path to the player and being forced to find a different NPC-filled way around the barrier? Now, real quick, before I go to the answer on that, let us take a look at the Cleric and that particular skill just so we can get a better viewpoint of that question. So, Celestial Aegis is where the Cleric manifests the Celestial Aegis for a limited duration. What that does, it places a massive shield of light in the environment, or even the Cleric can carry it for short distances. While it lasts, it's an immovable object that no enemy will be able to pass through. So it's basically a shield that the Cleric can throw up to block mobs from getting to them. So it sounds like it'd be very useful in a dungeon to kind of block a hallway so that you can escape or get healed up and get caught back up on your heels and things like that. But now we got some more information because it's actually a really good question to ask about that ability. So let's take a look at the answer. Because if you think about it, if there's a shield blocking you and it's not a hallway, right? Or even if it is a hallway, this works either way. What will the, what will the NPCs do? Will they try to path around it? Will it become an even larger train because as they path through different hallways, they're gonna be picking up new things. So the answer was, when NPCs encounter the Celestial Aegis Barrier, they will be limited in how far away they can look for a path around. If they can't find one within that range, they will try to break through the barrier. The barrier will have a certain amount of hit points, therefore it will either dissipate when the enemies break through it, or when the barrier's duration ends, whichever comes first. So, there we go. Now we kind of know a little bit more about that particular ability and how it's going to work. And that's very cool and very interesting. So if, if it's a long hallway, let's say, we don't know how long, how big this area of effect is that they will actually try to find a path around, but I think we can probably pretty much guess it's probably not too far from it. So if you run down a big hallway, you throw the shield down, they do not have the room in order to find another path around so you've got time to heal up, etc. Now if you're just out in the wild in an open space, they're going to go around it, right? And depending on how big that is, it may not buy you very much time. So they kind of that kind of shows you how each ability has more thought that went into it to make it something cool and something that you have to use strategically because that's what an MMO RPG like this is all about it's about that strategic value now let's move forward we have the druid and the wizard okay both of them in one question and the question is how will druid and wizard teleportation be handled so we do know that druids and wizards have some form of teleportation and until this newsletter we had absolutely no idea really i mean they kind of hinted around we didn't really know how it worked so let's look at this answer when a wizard approaches a gateway for the first time they will be able to discover it part of that process includes speaking with the npc gatewalker who oversees that portal whether through conversation or quest the wizard will gain access to that gateway as part of their network Every gateway they discover in this manner will become part of their ever-increasing network of gateways. Druids will encounter an identical process, utilizing Wandering Stones. So their plan is for the Wandering Stones and gateways to become increasingly available to Druids and Wizards as part of a growing interconnected network. Wizards and Druids will then be able to access all their Discover Portal locations through a UI window. At higher levels, druids, wizards will be able to teleport themselves to the primary gateway or wandering stone in order to access the network more quickly. In addition, they'll eventually be able to bring their group members with them through the gateway wandering stone network. So as this ability grows, it does get better from allowing the druid or the wizard to be able to teleport. And then as, it, as that ability gets better and you level up further, then you'll be able to bring your friends with you. And I really like the part about you don't just have to find 
the gateway or find the stone, but you have to talk to the M to the NPC gatewalker or stonekeeper or whatever they end up calling that and do a quest sometimes. N not always, you know, some of them you can just unlock by talking to them, but sometimes there's a quest. So if it's a really cool, a very convenient stone or gateway that is probably going to see a lot of traffic, you know, that kind of thing near important key places in the game, then we can probably look at a quest to unlock that. So that's just another layer added on to the coolness of the During the Wizard. It kind of gives us a peek into just a little bit, gives us a peek into where they're always talking about abilities and things that classes can do that require additional quests to unlock the ability. This is a small example of that. Now let's move forward. Next we have the warrior. The question is, warriors seem very dependent on shields. Will shields be exciting and worth using in Pantheon? The answer is absolutely. For one, shields will make up a significant portion of the warrior's armor class. Not only because shields will innately have very high armor class as part of their item identity, but because warriors will be able to synergize and capitalize on the aspect of shields to great effect. Secondly, and more importantly, warriors will gain access to powerful dynamic shield specific combat abilities that are offensive in nature, not just defensive. More on those specific abilities and seeing them in action soon. The goal is for warriors to take great pride in their shields and feel significantly stronger defensively and offensively because of them. So the warrior, and I know, I, I get it, some people are going to argue with me about this, but the warrior is, let's face it, the classic tank, okay? In most MMOs, but it's looking that way definitely in Pantheon Rise of the Fallen. So shields, of course, will be very important to defense. Generally, in most MMOs, also offensively, and now they have confirmed that to be a fact also in Pantheon. I think we all kind of, I think most of us, I mean, I feel like that question was a little weak because, come on, who people really ask that all the time? Of course, shields are going to be a big deal. I guess you got a lot of people out there who like to do two hand with warriors for a little bit better DPS, but in any case, now we know. Next up, we have the Ranger. So will rangers be viable DPS if they stick to ranged or melee attacks and don't weave between the two? So as you may or may not know, the ranger is known to get some get some hits in with the bow, then be able to weave some of their combo into moving up close for some melee attacks, and then be able to get back out of the battle again. But what this this question asks is what if you want to stick, what if you like melee combat? and you're not a big fan of range, can you still do viable DPS or vice versa? The answer is, I've given this one quite a bit of thought over the past many months. I can say that as of now, the answer to this is yes. Moving forward, the design of the Ranger class will focus on keeping them viable and competitive in DPS both at range and in melee combat, while leveraging their ability to weave between short and long range combat to create situational advantages that they can exploit while maintaining incredibly high mobility. We're also reworking the momentum resource quite a bit to support this playstyle and can't wait to show it in action. Yes, if you want to focus on one or two, you can do some viable DPS and then you can just use the, the weaving type abilities to get in and out simply for situational things that happen that would make that convenient. Now, I want to talk a little bit because he... Joppa mentions that they're reworking the momentum resource, okay, to support that play style. So I want to take a minute real quick and let's take a look at what that what the momentum is, what we know of it right now. So this is their combat resource. So momentum is something that the rangers generate as a percentage of the damage they deal. In addition, certain melee and range abilities will increase the ranger's momentum by a certain amount when used. Other abilities will have a momentum cost in order to be performed. The more momentum a ranger has, the faster their melee and range attack speed becomes, up to a 20% increase when momentum is full. When a ranger chooses to spend momentum, their melee and range attack speed will slow in proportion until the ranger builds their momentum up again. So momentum is the thing that the ranger is having to grapple with and manage during the course of the combat. So this is pretty good information now that I have that defined on that they're reworking that so that if people want to focus on just melee and use the range only in certain situations or vice versa, they can. And I find that super interesting and really gives the ranger 
a lot more flexibility, you know, to where when you're grouping up with random rangers, they could be a various assortment of play styles, and that's cool. Next up, we have a question on the rogue. Looking at opportunity, how big of a role will stealth play in combat? The answer is, having just finished a stealth system overall, including a true detection-based system, we're more excited than ever to show off the stealth system and the role it will play for rogues in direct combat. Stealth is intended to play a major role for rogues in combat when it suits them. Like rangers, rogues are being designed in a way to seamlessly weave in and out of stealth during combat as it fits the occasion or offers an advantage. The key is that rogues should not take a heavy DPS loss by leaving direct combat to go into stealth, assuming the focus remains on DPS in the target. Therefore, we are working to tune the opportunity slash endurance resource relationship to facilitate that. So they're doing some work on the rogue to, you know, make sure they don't take too big of a DPS loss when they have to do that, you know, slip into stealth, you know, I don't, maybe just to get behind them, do a backstab, that kind of thing. That's very cool and should be pretty exciting news for everybody who's looking to play the rogue, that they have that flexibility. And also to Minus. Minus from Pantheon Plus is playing on playing a rogue, so I'm sure he's super psyched about that. Next up, the summoner. How powerful will the summoner's pet be? and how powerful will the summoner be in comparison? That's a really cool question. So, the answer is, to put it simply, the Archimental is intended to be the powerhouse. If I had to put it in terms of a percentage, a Fury would provide around 70% of the total DPS output of the summoner's class. The Archimental should feel just as much a part of the class of the player as the summoner, especially given that so much of the Archimental's damage and effectiveness will come from how the player chooses to equip the Archimental and invest its unique stat points. It should feel like a very symbiotic relationship. So, uh, the Archimental and the Summoner are one. Yes, they are two separate entities, but as you're leveling up your Summoner, you're also leveling up your Archimental, who plays a huge part of the class, and I mean, you're even putting stat points into that Archimental unique ones that you choose and, and equip. That is so cool. I didn't even realize that was how the summoner class is gonna work. I know I got a lot of summoner fans out there on this channel that, that listen to my stuff and I'm glad we got some information about that because that's fantastic. Next up we have the Enchanter. And this is a really good question. Will Enchanters be the top DPS using Charm? How powerful would Charmed Mob be? So just real quick, in case you didn't know, Charm is the ability to be able to take a mob, charm it, and temporarily make it your pet, so that you can turn it against other creatures. Charms typically don't last very long. You have to keep them up, or else you're screwed. <laughs> so let's see what they said about that. So while much of this will be tuned in Alpha and Beta, the general design direction is that NPCs will not be at 100% strength when charmed. For the Pantheon Enchanter, Charm is primarily designed as a crowd control mechanism, not a DPS mechanism. That said, there will be ways to reduce the penalty applied to a Charmed NPC's power. You will also have access to certain NPC's abilities when Charmed, which will make the decision of what the Charm and how to use it much more interesting. Well, that's cool. So there's abilities that the mob will be that the mob does that, when Charmed, you'll have access to use those. And that, I mean, just think about all the abilities it's possible for mobs to have, to be able to stun even, to, you know, all kinds of options are probably available in the various freaking NPCs in Terminus. Let's, let's just think about how powerful that statement actually is. Let's also think about the fact that they're saying they want it to be a, a crowd control mechanism, right? But also think about those times, for example, for example, okay? Militus from Standing in Fire told a really cool story the other night about how he charmed a mob, an elite mob, that was surrounded with ads, okay? It had a bunch of guards around him, ads, that he couldn't have, he was solo, and he couldn't have possibly defeated all those ads. He was too squishy. So what he did was, he charmed the elite mob, kept his charm up, stayed on top of it, and it began, of course, attacking the gu its guards, its ads, and it took a lot of them down. It didn't take all of them down. And then he lost charm. He was able to kill the elite because his health was so low from all the ads hitting him. 
He had a couple ads left, and then he was able to run just far enough for their leash to activate and then go back and collect his reward. So he was able to do something kind of incredible using Charm. And I've seen all kinds of things in MMOs using Charm, and it's a very cool ability. Now we kind of know that although it's for crowd control, you can still use it in a DPS type situation. It's going to be very situational. It's going to be one of those things where you're going to see an enchanter do something really cool one day just because they truly mastered charm and they probably went out of their way to unlock charm, make it more powerful through quests, secret quests, and things like that. So, very awesome. I like that. Anyway, let's move on. We have the Dire Lord. All right. If the Dire Lord is unable to wear plate armor, won't they be unviable as a main tank in raids? That's a good question. And it's a question I think we've all asked, okay? Let's see what they say and then we'll talk about it. So the answer Joppa gave is, perhaps with certain physical damage heavy encounters or bosses, and depending on specific encounter mechanics, Dire Lords may struggle compared to their higher AC warriors and paladins. However, from the conversations I hear and read, I think the Dire Lord's incredible magical damage mitigation is being heavily undervalued. You can trust that we are designing content with all three tanks in mind, and there will be plenty of in-game content where the Dire Lord will shine the brightest. Okay, so that's the thing about Pantheon that I really like. We're gonna, I'm gonna hold off on the full conversation until I get to the next one. But don't forget, is what he's trying to say, that this is the tank to mitigate magical damage so when you have high magical damage on that raid boss there is no better tank in that situation than the dire lord however you can still tank that with a paladin or a warrior but they will struggle in that situation where the dire lord will be supreme so if you can't get a dire lord for that particular raid boss you can roll with the warrior paladin you better have a good healer you know what i mean you better have good heals if you have the Dire Lord, that fight is going to be easier. But it doesn't make it impossible without him. But you see, he has value in certain situations. He can probably still tank things that other raid bosses that are more physical damage. He can. He'll just struggle more. You, do you see? It's a balance, okay? And that's the way MMOs should be, okay? We don't need all the tanks to be exactly the same with different names to their abilities. But we're going to move forward. We'll talk more about that. Next up, we have the Paladin. Will there be enough undead content to justify the Paladin's forte versus undead? So, as you probably know, the Paladin was designed to be a powerhouse against the undead. This is the class I'm going to play. I'm super excited about going into crypts, graveyards, and just wiping through some undead. But, is there going to be enough content for that to really matter, okay? And the answer from Joppa is yes. I'll go so far to say that at launch and beyond, one of the main NPC groups in the Terminus storyline, making up one of our end game raid areas, is entirely corrupted with undeath. Paladins will be excellent competitive main tanks that will have plenty of opportunities to flex their versus undeath prowess. Clerics too. I'd like to mention Clerics also has that. So just like I was talking about before, this even more cements it in. The Paladin, he's your go-to guy, he or she, your go-to tank for undead content. Okay, the best. Can a warrior or a dire lord still tank that content? Absolutely. But they will be at a disadvantage. Physical attacks, right? A lot of physical damage on this particular raid boss. Warrior, gonna be your go-to. He can mitigate physical damage the best. Dire Lord, magical damage, number one tank. Undead, which as they said, there's a huge part of the actual story in the world of Terminus about a certain NPC group of people, a cult, or who knows, we'll find out, that makes up one of their in-game raid areas. So an entire raid area, that's not completely defined, but we know there are several zones full of in-game raids and content. So at least a huge portion of one of those zones, maybe a whole zone, that would be cool, I'm going to be a paladin, so I'm down with that. But we kind of get a good picture of that, of, of how the tanks are going to work, and I like that. Next up, we have the Monk. Will Thane Death end up trivializing content? 
how do you plan to keep that from happening? So as we all know, especially people that came from EverQuest, playing death, it's used for so many things. I mean, it's so powerful of an ability. Let's see how they how they answer that. Joppa says, while Fane Death is a wildly powerful skill that has the potential to trivialize content, that risk is l largely proportionate to the ways the skill can be countered. If there is nothing to counter Fane Death except the level difference of the monk versus the surrounding NPCs, then yes, the risk of trivializing content is real. In Pantheon, we plan to let Fane Death be powerful, but we'll provide several potential counters to it through the disposition system. On your first run through a dungeon or part of a dungeon, the monk may be able to pull with no problem using Fain Death to break camps, etc. But after getting respawns or moving deeper in, you'll start encountering NPCs with the true sight or cunning disposition, both of which can see through Fain Death. Suddenly you have a hard counter that will require a different strategy without going deeper into Fain Death's mechanics just yet. You can be assured that this is one way we plan to keep Thane Death powerful and under control. Exciting news for the monk. I mean, adding that additional layer where yes, we know with the disposition system there are different types of the same NPC can react differently. And some of them just don't fall for it, guys. They're like, okay, buddy, you're not dead. You didn't just you didn't just die. I see through this crap, right? So very cool. Next up, and the last one we have is the shaman. Can you tell us more about the Shaman Pet? The answer is, I'll cover that in the next installment of Burning Questions. Can you explain how Walk the Ages will work? Walk the Ages. Mark a moment in time, leaving an imprint, imprint of your spirit where you are currently standing for a certain duration. When you activate Walk the Ages again, you will instantly return to this location. You cannot cross zone lines with this ability. However, in addition to that description, that we already had, Joppa clarifies a few things. Here's what he says. This ability will have a maximum range, which is yet to be determined. You will not be able to use this ability to bring you back to the zone line from the bottom of a dungeon, but it should be generous enough to allow you some flexibility to be as helpful as possible in most situations. Another great aspect of this ability is that it will clear the shaman's aggro when used and that is very important information. So this really is an ultimate ability to get the heck out of there, okay? Drop aggro, and you know, just think about the complexities of groups and what can happen. Could a shaman, being a, a healer type, could they possibly throw out some massive heals, attract the attention of the mobs in a bad situation? I'm talking about like, we're trying to escape get the attention of mobs, and if he, time, he or she times it perfectly, be able to use the walk, the ages ability, and then drop aggro, and everybody else had already started running as he was grabbing the aggro, and then suddenly everybody's out of the situation, can't get away. You see what I'm saying? So these are all things that in alpha and beta we'll get to find out and they'll be fine tuning. But guys, I hope you enjoyed this. I thought this was so cool. And the really great news is that this is going to be an ongoing thing. I don't know about every single month, if every newsletter will get this, that would be really cool. But this is a ton of information, guys. As a matter of fact, this might be my most informative video just because it breaks down something about every single class. There's something for literally everybody, a juicy nugget. Thank you so much, Mr. Joppa, for answering these questions and giving us a lot of insight into these. And I know, for me, Paladin was my class, and that was my most burning question, no doubt, is how much content will the Paladin be super wanted for, okay? But guys, I hope you enjoyed the video today, and I hope that if you're not already subscribed, you go ahead and smash that subscribe button. Hit that like button for me, too. That really helps this video get out there to other people. And for you for the YouTube algorithm to suggest it that kind of thing So please hit that like button leave me a comment down below what you think about your class that you're interested in Or other classes you're not interested in but you found interesting Whatever you want to talk about guys Let's get the conversation going in the comments section down below and until next time guys God bless and happy gaming Listen to what I say I've been making videos all day my friends all say I'm It's a video buffet You can even hit replay But please just subscribe I can't even describe Being
Indian part of my tribe. I'll even offer you a prize, but just please just subscribe and hit the bell notification too.